Let me turn it over to Nate to provide innovative insights this morning. Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's, it's already the end of October, isn't it? Right? Um, the uh, summer seemed like it flew by, and it's, and it's already fall. Um, and it seems like my family spent the majority of the summer outside, right, at the pool. Um, and, and in a snap, really, uh, now I'm dropping my child off at, at daycare, right, in the mornings. Um, not daycare, I'm sorry. Uh, she's, she's in preschool, right? She, she graduated from daycare. Um, they had a ceremony and everything. There were robes. Um, we, we, we literally congratulated her uh, for her ability to age, right? Um, no, but she was into it, so we encouraged it. And, and the, the thing that surprised me most, right, about daycare, I'm sorry, about preschool, um, is all of the birthday parties, right? I mean, there's, there's one of these a week with these kids. And with, with birthday parties themselves, right, it's, it's you're not, you're not you know, you, you, you learn growing up, right, that, um, okay, when you, when you have kids, uh, these kids are going to be expensive, but they don't tell you how expensive other kids are going to be, right? It's, in reality, I need to create a, a GoFundMe to, like, fund them, so, so to speak. Um, but uh, it took about a week, and, and my kids started asking, uh, my daughter, Leah, she's four, um, started asking, well, you know, Daddy, when is it, it going to be my birthday, Right? And it's hard to explain seven months to a four-year-old, right? It's, it's impossible. You can't do it, right? Um, so what I decided to do is I crouched down with her, right? Um, and I said, Leah, do you see the beautiful green leaves on the trees? She goes, well, yeah, right? I said, soon those leaves are going to change colors and they're going to fall to the ground. And she goes, and die? And I go, you betcha. Um, and I said, and then it's going to snow, and it's going to get cold, and it's going to be miserable for a really long time. And it's Ohio, right? So we're going to get a, a week in late February where you're going to get your hopes up. It's going to get warm, and then it's going to dump a foot of snow on us. But here's the deal, Leah. Then it'll be your birthday, right? And her, her birthday is the week of, of St. Patrick's Day. And she looks at me, and I'm kind of grimacing, right, waiting for a reaction. She looks at me, and she goes, got it, right? And that was surprising. Right, she got it, okay, cool. Big one for dad, like walking around the house, waiting for my wife to roll her eyes, right? Um, so anyways, a couple, couple days go by, and I get home from work, um, and, I, and I walk up to the front of our house. Um, and we, have a, we have a front porch, right? And we, and we build our front porch for the same reason anybody builds a front porch, right? So you can stay dry while you sit on it and judge your neighbors, right? Um, and, uh, but anyways, I, I, I walked up on, onto the front porch, and I met with just sidewalk chalk everywhere, right? I just told you, right? Like, it's a, it's a covered front porch. So to me, immediately, I'm thinking like, oh, man. I'm going to have to get the hose out and hose all this down, right? Like, this is, this is ridiculous. But, but it was covered in what I initially thought were stars and constellations. And I walk inside, ready to, you know, essentially ask my wife, hey, what, what's going on with the sidewalk chalk, right? Like, we have a sidewalk for this. And she already has a grin on her face. And I'm like, what's going on with this? And she goes, you told your daughter that it had to snow before it could be her birthday, right? And it tells us that the children are very creative, aren't they? Um, and, and we applaud their creativity uh, because it builds confidence, right? And there are plenty of resources out there about creativity and building confidence, but, but this talk is more centered around innovation. And I want to point out that creativity and innovation are very, very different, right? Creativity removes bounds and constraints, right? It suggests that really anything is possible and that there are no wrong answers. How much have we heard that in the workplace, right? And we're going to have a brainstorm, and by the way, there's no wrong answers. I know there should be. I mean, we have to pay our bills, right? <laughs> um, but you see, we're born with creativity, right? But we lose it over time. And I've got a quote, and I want to make sure I get it right, so I wrote it down, right? Um, so, Tom Kelly, right, the author of Creative Confidence, the D School, says it turns out that creativity isn't some rare gift to be enjoyed by the lucky few. It's a natural part of human thinking and behavior, and too many of us it can get blocked, but it can be restored, right? And that's a big deal, because we've learned how to bring creativity back, and companies have started encouraging it, and it's the essence of design thinking, isn't it, right? Companies encouraging us to be very, very creative. And what it does is it helps us be very comfortable 
feeling very uncomfortable. But here's the deal. We're not born with skills to help us problem solve. These are skills that we learn over time. It's a skill that we craft with a lot of practice. And my fear is that we've done a ton of work to bring creativity back into the workplace, into startups, into big co's, right? But we're calling it innovation. And what that means, right, and what I've seen, is that while innovative ideas can be very creative, a lot of times what we end up getting is creativity that's not very innovative. It's very surface level, right? We spend 15 minutes coming up with 30 ideas that aren't possible because they don't, make, you know, they don't go into our current workflows. And that's not what innovation is, right? Innovation takes things that exist a lot of times, right? Uh, it solves the same problem, but we innovate on the solution to make it better, right? That can be creative, but they're two different definitions. I want to take a step back, right? I want to take a step back and, um, and talk about, I, I, I always love going to startup weeks, right? Not only because they're fun and because you get to meet a lot of new people, but I, I, I really enjoy the themes that make themselves known throughout these types of events and conferences. And I think that this one is very, very unique, right? Here at, here at Startup NC. And that's that we're trying to create an ecosystem, right? A lot of startup uh, weeks, they want to support the local startups. They, they're, they're trying to do good things, right? But we're trying to create an ecosystem, and, and we're trying to create an ecosystem that supports technology, right? And that's very easy to say, right? But it's very, very difficult to create an ecosystem. It's much like being an entrepreneur, right, or an innovator. It's like really easy to say that you are one, but it's really, really hard to be one, right? I want to take this back to children for a second and, and point out, essentially, right, that children, as children progress through early childhood, they play games that teach them skills that are necessary for innovation. We encourage this, right? So I want to run through a few of them. So essentially what I'm going to do, like, none of these are going to, none of these are going to take anyone by surprise, right? And you're going to say, oh, come on, Nate, like, these children's games, they don't really teach us life skills, but, but I, want you to, I want you to focus on what the child has to deal with during these, right? And this isn't an exhaustive list. I'm not saying that I'm a childhood, you know, early childhood education um, expert, but I do have a four-year-old, and she's very opinionated, and I spent the last four years, well, number one, keeping her alive, right? But number two, observing, <laughs> right? So, so let's start with a game, and let's have fun with it. If you think of some things on your own, you're going to be right, right? So the, the first one, right? It was in the title of the talk, Duck, Duck, Goose, right? Um, so let's, let's talk about, duck. before we go into the components of Duck, Duck, du duck, duck, duck Goose, um, we have, some, we have some friends in the upper Midwest that call it Duck, Duck, Gray Duck. Have you heard this? Duck, Duck, Gray Duck. See, I even assume people from Minnesota just live in like South Canada, right? And it's called a Canadian goose, right? It's hilarious. Um, but, you know, th this isn't a talk um, about how the Bengals beat the Vikings in, in week one, right? So we'll, we'll move on there. But, but let, let's talk about Duck, Duck, Goose, right? Um, in Duck, Duck, Goose, you have uh, a number of children, age doesn't matter, uh, in, in a circle, and then you have one person who is it. They're the goose, right? And they walk around the circle, and they start tapping, and they're like, duck, duck, duck. And then they tap a goose, and they have to run around the circle and sit in the child spot that, that got up and is, is, is chasing them. And, and what I want to point out here is that it teaches children a couple of things, right? Because they have to think ahead, right? So obviously one of those is, who are they going to pick, right? So they're going to pick someone that they think that they can beat. But it also shows that a child gets immediate feedback, right? If they don't want to be the goose and they pick someone who's faster than them, they're going to be the goose for a while, right? It's interesting, right? Uh, let's look at another one, hopscotch, right? So in hopscotch, I'm going to take a piece of chalk, and I'm going to draw a series of boxes, and I'm going to number them, and I'm going to take a rock, and I'm going to toss it. And think about, think about early childhood, right? Like, think about really, really young kids here. Young kids that haven't developed a lot of their... Um, I don't know if you call them gross motor skills, right? Hopping on one foot, right? It's hard, right? And so when a child starts and they're like, okay, I have to decide actually what foot I'm going to start with, right? Like as adults, we don't really think about that. We just, we just go, right? We can hop on the, on the either foot, really. Um, but a child has to plan a course of action because if they don't, they're going to get stumped and then they're going to fall and then they're going to have to start over, right? I thought that was great. Um, the, the next one is Simon Says. Um, I think Simon Says is interesting because when you get a group of children no matter how young they are, no matter how hard it is to keep their focus, they instantly become competitive because they don't want to be the one that does something wrong. Isn't that true? Isn't that true in the workplace? 
we don't want to be the one that does something wrong. And so we just try to follow direction. It's fascinating, right? It's paying attention as well. Um, musical chairs. Th this, is, this is really one of, my, one of my most favorite ones, right? So in musical chairs, you have excuse me, a, a lineup of chairs either, either in a circle, right, or, or in a rectangle. And what, you're, what you might be thinking is that musical chairs teaches us how to be fast. But I don't actually think that that's true, is it? Musical chairs teaches us to anticipate. And let's understand why, right? Because I can, I can control myself right next to this chair. I can walk really, really slow, and I can take a giant step and walk really, really slow. So it's really not about speed, is it? It's about positioning. And we're gonna come back to that one, because I think that was really, really important. But there's an aspect of musical chairs that a person can't control, right? And that's the, that's the person controlling the music. And children have to think about that, and they have to anticipate where they're gonna be when the music stops. I think that's awesome. I um, mean, lastly, hide and seek, right? So we'll just we'll stop here. Um, hide and seek is interesting because when you think about a course, let's say you in your neighbor's backyard and a number of children, right? Children are going to look for hiding spots that provide advantages. And if they don't, they'll start doing it really quick, right? Uh, not not too traveled areas, right? Not high foot traffic. Uh, maybe it'll be shaded, right? A little bit darker than others. But the more and more they play the same course, don't they adapt, right? They start to notice the hiding places that are most used or that are most visited by the person seeking. And they learn to choose different places that haven't been visited yet. Isn't that interesting when we start thinking about companies? I'd like to suggest that our ability to innovate is very, very similar, right? But I think that our skills have gotten pretty rusty. And in some cases, we've replaced them with bad habits, right? Here's one. <laughs> Too often we hear the phrase, um, it's just an idea until someone executes. I'm gonna venture to say that that's probably said by someone who has never actually executed before. Because we actually know that there's a lot more involved in this, right? So I wanna, I wanna um, take the rest of the time that I have and talk about some ways that we can start to overcome this, right? And I'd like to suggest there are four really powerful elements of innovation. And together they form an acronym. And, and I know you're like, oh, thank God, right? Am I going to get through another conference and not have to learn five new acronyms that are going to teach me how to be an adult, right? So I've got one for you as well. Um, and it spells the word CAPE, right? Um, and it's so C-A-P-E. And it's concentration, anticipation, preparation, and then execution, right? And we're going to take another step back just real quick and talk about why I chose that word, right? Um, and the reason is, is because entrepreneurs are sometimes called superheroes, aren't they? And at first I was like, oh, come on, really? A little imposter syndrome maybe, right? But, but like, really, can, can we make this work? But, but as I started to dig into it a little bit more and I looked at what an entrepreneur and an innovator really is, and then I looked at what a superhero is, right? So let's start with the superhero. A superhero takes risks for the betterment of what they think society needs, right? They put themselves out there and they do what's right. Oftentimes at the detriment of their own safety in many cases, right? Their own well-being. And they do it without thinking because they know it's right. When you think about innovators and you think about entrepreneurs, isn't it true, right? Especially successful ones, you're like, wow, they make this look so easy, right? But the reality is, is they're willing to take unnecessary risks for the betterment of of the people that they care about and, and of the lives that they want to change. And that, and that really is something that uh, they, they should be called superheroes in that, in that instance. So let's break it down, right? So C, concentration. Um, isn't this something that we encourage in our kids, right? Don't we encourage them to concentrate? Like we, um, we ask them to focus on very singular tasks and we reward that, right? Tie your shoes, <laughs> eat your dinner, make your bed, brush your teeth, very singular tasks. But in the business world, we've become accustomed to losing focus or focusing on too many things because we almost need to, we need to broaden our circle to gain more attention if we think we're going to get this thing through. But big ideas tend to not be very innovative, right? Because they're hard to implement. If you want to implement something, it needs to be something very concentrated. And so what, what you end up seeing with startups that end up being successful, right, is they solve a real problem. They're not a culmination of 50 features because people told them that they would use it if they did it. 
It's very interesting. And another um, aspect that I want to add on to this is how we give and receive feedback. Because there's two different types of feedback, isn't there? Yeah? There's advice and there's guidance. Right? We're very quick to give our children advice, aren't we? Aren't we? But do you know what advice is? Advice is you need to change something. Let me give you some advice. You need to change something. <laughs> right? Guidance is what you tell someone when you still want them to make their own decision, isn't it? Have you thought about? Have you thought about doing this? Have you considered what would happen if? Right? I think oftentimes um, as mentors or as companies, we're very quick to offer advice to startups and innovators, aren't we? We're very quick to tell them that they need to change something, and if they do, then we think they'd have a better chance. But oftentimes we have very little context. We don't have nearly as much context as the innovator does as to why they're making decisions. So what if we became better at giving guidance like good parents do in their children? Well, let's move on. So A, anticipation, right? We talked about musical chairs. I think that's a great way to look at anticipation. Uh, we need to do a better job of working to understand what's coming next, right? When you think about innovation um, and you think about the way companies anticipate uh, what, what is coming next, if you only ask your customers what they want, you'll always be one step behind, won't you? Because if you do what they ask you to do and you launch it, then all of a sudden they'll be asking for something else. So how do we anticipate better? And I think the way that we do that is we, we stop focusing so much on what people tell us, because if it's true innovation, they've probably never seen this before, right? And we base our innovative ideas not on what people tell us through positive reinforcement, we're just telling you that they hate your idea, right? Which is what happens. And we start basing it on data that currently exists, right? It's all out there. Because remember what I said, right? Innovation isn't normally, isn't typically, right? Taking a brand new idea to society that doesn't exist and just introducing it, right? It takes something, um, it takes something that exists, right? It takes something that someone is currently doing, a job that is being accomplished, and you're providing a new way of doing that. And data should exist that proves that that should be innovated on, right? So how do we anticipate and solve that type of problem? Uh, preparation. I like this one a lot, right? Uh, there are three types of innovators, just three, right? Uh, the, the first is the person um, who is the innovator who really takes a step back when they're thinking about innovating or they're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur. And they want to make sure that they are ready to, to do this, right? They're, they're, they take a long time in making sure uh, in themselves that they're ready to take that leap toward innovation, right? And I call it the, the they're, they're waiting to get ready. So they're the, okay, all right, I'm ready, right? I'm ready. I, I'm, I'm going to start this. I'm going to do this. We, we need to do this, right? I'm, I'm, I think I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, let's go. And once they aim and once they fire, they end up being very grounded in what they want to accomplish. But it just takes them a long time to actually take that first step. The second type is a person that is always ready, right? Let's, let's do this, right? But they, they end up aiming to make sure that uh, they're, they're solving essentially the right problem, but they tend to aim too long, right? And so sometimes uh, this gets masked as, um, if you've heard founder syndrome or inventor syndrome, right? Um, where you invent a product that's like ready to go to market, but you're afraid to release it because you're afraid of what people will think of it, right? Or, or um, you see other competition that's out there and they're releasing something that has maybe something more than yours does. And you think, oh man, okay, now I've got to leapfrog them before I can release my product. And then you end up never actually launching it. Right? But once they do launch it, they learn very, very quickly how to adapt. They just need to get it out there. And then there's the third type. They're the type that just fires. Wait, hang on, should we have aimed? Right? <laughs> right? They fire before they're, they're ready. But the, the excuse that they typically give is, well, at least I've got a product out there and I'm learning from it. Because right? then they can always adapt. When I think about preparation, it's the last step before execution, isn't it? Right? Rarely does someone come up with an idea and execute completely on it by themselves. Right? It's the same thing in raising a child, isn't it? It takes a village. And my call is for individuals, if you, if you can identify who you are, which type of the three, to surround yourself with people that are not like you, because it'll make you better. And isn't centrifuge that? Isn't that interesting? Centrifuge is able to come alongside companies, no matter what stage they're in, and provide value, right? Um, you all know that I'm, I'm heavily, like, very heavily involved. I'm passionate about FinTech Frontier. And I think that this is key. 
because we have a pitch competition in two days, right? We're excited about it. But a pitch competition doesn't make a startup successful, does it? It helps. But we're serving different staged startups. Some of them are totally idea stage, right? I have a dream. <laughs> I have a dream stage. Um, some of them have started development, and maybe their product's developed, but they, but they don't have a lot of customers yet. And then others are, are revenue stage companies that, that need the partnerships, the acquisitions, customers, et cetera. How great is it that we have an organization that's able to meet you where you are and surround you with individuals uh, to help you in the areas where you need help, right? Isn't that what FinTech Frontier is? And finally, execution. I think if you do the first three steps well, execution becomes the most straightforward, doesn't it? Right? It's the part that catches the most people off guard. Because um, when you're ready to execute, oftentimes there are lapses in how we communicate with people that are different than us. But, but it becomes the most straightforward if you prepare well. And I hope that you do it. And I hope that you take the leap. And if you're not connected with Centrifuge and you're not connected with an ESP, uh, an entrepreneurial uh, services provider, I hope that you get in touch with one. And if you don't know how to, I'm really easy to get a hold of. Uh, thank you.